Greetings, greetings everyone, give thanks, give thanks. It's nice to sit and listen sometimes. And when I listen to the young artists them that were performing earlier on. And nowadays when you hear much people talk, the first thing they say is that the young artists, all them sing is slackness, girl and this and those things. And what you hear on the radio from the young artists is consistent with that thinking. Who you know shoot down your murder and all those things. But listening to the youths them this evening, what it shows, and this is something I've always maintained, that more good songs are being made than the bad songs. But because they play more of the bad songs, it appears that our artist is only putting out the bad songs. And therefore, the media plays an important part in making sure that the bad songs come out. And brothers and sisters, I'm certain of what we hear tonight, if these artists got more earplay, then certainly it would make a big difference as to the quality that comes out. It would also make a big difference as to the income that would come in to the good artist and therefore encourage him or her to continue to make more and better music. But if you continue to play the rubbish, and more money go to the rubbish artist, he will be encouraged to make more rubbish. And despite, despite IRFM having Sister Cabo and Brother Muta, they have done a lot to make sure that the rubbish artists come to our ears. Yes. So brothers and sisters, we got to do something about that. With regards to Leonard Howell, and yeah, I know you have had some brilliant speakers earlier on. I just want to say, at that era of time, 1930, the early 1930s, there were many outstanding Rastafari philosophers and teachers. For example, there was a brother named Athley Rogers. He came from Nevis. You know, you have some Caribbean islands, and you have one named St. Kitts, Nevis, and Anguilla. Athley Rogers came from, not Nevis, not Anguilla, small island. Now, he wrote a book named The Holy Pibby. And in that book, The Holy Pibby, he declared that book the black man's Bible. And he made it clear that you could never put a King James Bible on his altar. Arthur Rogers, right throughout, the book came out in the 1930s, and he pointed to the God of Ethiopia. He was very strong when he speaks of the God of Ethiopia. <coughs> Another brother from Jamaica here, Reverend Fitz Ballantyne and he wrote a brilliant book in the 1930s also and that book was entitled The Royal Parchment Scroll of Black Supremacy. The title alone uplifts you coming out in the 1930s. A book which the Gleaner Company at the time, the Gleaner writer says what people will adhere to that rubbish in reference to that book. So you know if the Gleaner call it rubbish, you know what I and I would call it. And he also points to the God of Ethiopia and the Black God and the Black Realm and the Black Princess and the Black Empress. He wrote glowingly. And there were other great writers in that 1930s. You see the writers came from being speakers. 
and you used to have many black speakers on the corner of Spanish Town Road, round by Bond Street, Princess Street, downtown and so on. That many speakers, especially on a Sunday evening, and many of them, apart from speaking, they wrote books. Now, what makes Leonard Howell at that time stand out? And this now, I'm going to ask, does anyone here to, to, to tell me? All these are the great writers and speakers, and they all point to the God of Ethiopia. But who can tell me now, in that constellation of stars, what you think makes Leonard Howell, why we are here tonight, celebrating that great man? Come, my brother, come forward now. This man make it look easy. Yeah, well, most of the persons in this refer to majesty and king, but Leonard Owl was the first one to declare Haile Selassie as that king. Is he correct? Yes. Let me hear you. Is he correct? Yes. Let's give him a big round of applause, brothers and sisters. He carried it to the higher level. The others wrote about the great king. They wrote about Ethiopia. They wrote about Ethiopia being that majestical place and so on but leonard howell now made it clear when you say the great king he was referring to none other than haile selassie the first and that's what made him stand out in that 1930s era brothers and sisters <coughs> and if you're gonna stand out amongst those so much other great writers and speakers then naturally the persecutions is also going to stand out and he is by far the most persecuted Rastafarian brother. We have not yet started to honor Leonard Howell. As I sat there, a brother came and asked me, he says, Ras Miguel, where is Leonard Howell buried? I told him, Dove cut. He says, why? <coughs> Naturally, I can't answer why, but one thing I do know is that we ought to do something about that. Because his family has a good portion of land at Redlands in Clarendon. So, Sister Kathy has left, but she gave me her number before she leave. I will discuss it with her and we will see how we can get him out from there and put him in a mausoleum much more honorable to his yeah. dignity and his achievements. Um, another brother that we should also remember um, and this brother is buried within the prison walls at St. Catherine he is the son of Claudius Henry the peacemaker Many of you may not have known of the history, but Claudius Henry has a, had a son. Um, I think it was Leonard Henry. Ronald Henry, thank you. And Ronald had come to Jamaica not with the intention of taking on the Jamaican government but to secure recruits to go to Africa to fight the liberation struggle there. They were hounding his father, Claudius, and persecuting him greatly. And Ronald didn't, couldn't sit back and allow that. It ended up that him and the state ended up in war. At that time, we had some white soldiers representing the army here. And they went up into Red Hills after him. And so they had to defend themselves. A couple of the white soldiers were killed. And so that turned out to be a big thing here in Jamaica. Eventually, Ronald was captured. When they were leading him to the gallows over at Spanish Town, 
and they were going to put the thing over his face. He said, no, I don't want that. And I want to declare that I believe in the philosophy and opinions of the Honorable Marcus Garvey. Those were his last words, brothers and sisters. And then he was hung. His body is within the walls of the St. Catherine District Prison and we think is a brother that ought to be honored and take note and placed in a proper place for him at the peacemakers function where they still have a settlement. So brothers and sisters, as we honor great people, great brothers amongst us, it's not for them to decide who are our heroes. It's for I and I to decide that based on the works that we have seen of our outstanding brothers and sisters. And among I and I, as Rastafari, I'm certain that many of us here know of some humble, very humble Rastafari brethren that has taught us and has been an example unto us, but you never hear them name call amongst the celestial of greatness. But it is up to I and I to continue and to make sure that all our outstanding ones, many of whom went to bed many nights hungry so that I and I could hear and come to know of this great philosophy. We give thanks. So let us continue to heal His Imperial Majesty Emperor Helia Selassie the First, Ja Rastafari, who has not only taught us so much things, but he himself, he was crowned on the 2nd of November in Addis Ababa at the St. Michael Cathedral and that crowning was an announcement to the world. You had many world dignitaries that attended that crowning. That's what he did. But after that crowning, he then went to Aksum where the Ark of the Covenant is. And at the St. Mary of Zion Church, he was crowned again. That was now the private and celestial crowning amongst the constitution of angels. So brothers and sisters, when we heal him, it's not an ordinary heal. We are connecting with him and we are journeying with him and we are thanking him for coming upon this earth and blessing us. I give thanks. One love, black heart, give thanks, majesty.